Uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Walid Al-Habashi. Uh, he's a friend of mine. He, he, he did a lot of uh, job online during the COVID pandemic. Uh, he will speak about the role of the lung, no, gastric ultrasound in perioperative and ICU settings. Dr. Walid is a consultant of anesthesia and, and uh, intensive care in Dorset Country Hospital, United Kingdom. Please, Dr. Walid. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, I hope you can see my presentation clearly and can hear me well. Yeah, it's clear. It's clear. You can go. Fantastic. Okay. So, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, thanks so much for the kind uh, invitation to the 24th uh, Azaik. And this year, unfortunately, from a Zoom platform, I was there for the last five years and I really miss everyone there. Special thanks for uh, Professor Dr. Ashraf Arafat and uh, the scientific uh, board and organizing committee. Today, I'm taking you through a 20 minutes journey, a quick one on gastric ultrasound in uh, ICU and uh, perioperative settings. <coughs> Pardon me. And uh, I'm currently ICU Locum consultant in Dorset and Dorset is in the southwest on the uh, seashore side of uh, UK, two hours driving from uh, London Heathrow Airport. So uh, by the end of this lecture, uh, you will be aware of what are the indications and limitations of the point of care gastric ultrasound. You will know how to acquire and interpret the images of the gastric ultrasound. You will be aware and uh, know how to analyze the gastric content, both quanti qualitatively and quantitatively. And, uh, it, as well, you will know what is the current evidence behind gastric ultrasound use in those uh, uh, populations and the anesthesia and ICU settings uh, as well. <coughs> Sorry. So I have nothing to disclose related to this uh, lecture. Uh, as you all know, uh, the aspiration of gastric contents is a serious complication of anesthesia and carries anesthesia high mortality and morbidity uh, because of that. So the overall incidence is something between 1% uh, and 19% incidence, depending on the population you're talking about and uh, the mortality uh, related or the death related uh, anesthesia or that this is related to aspiration in anesthesia is up to 9%, which is a big, big figure. So, uh, and as you know, uh, the fasting guidelines helps to limit the risk in the elective surgeries with, minim with minimal comorbidities. But unfortunately, these aspiration risks is not, there's no clear guidance or applicable guidance on how to fast in the emergency and urgent conditions. So, which makes it a bit challenging with higher mortality and morbidity compared to the elective population. So here comes the gastric ultrasound or gastric point of care ultrasound, which gives us uh, an idea about the fluid and solid content of the gastric antrum. So it's really feasible. It's, it's, uh, it's allowing you to know uh, which patient population you're dealing with, is he fasting or not fasting? It's um, in, in both non-reliable conditions uh, like urgent procedures, emergency procedures, or uh, special medical conditions like pregnancies and, and diabetes in, in times of trauma and pain. So uh, gastric ultrasound helps a lot uh, to determine one of three categories, empty stomach, clear fluids or thick fluids versus solids. So uh, when clear fluids are there, uh, you need to estimate the volume of the amount of fluids. So if it's empty, that's fine. Patient has an empty stomach. Clear fluids, you need to measure how much fluids in this sto in the stomach. If it is anything more than 1.5 ml per kg, it's considered a full stomach. And if it is solid, it's definitely a full stomach. You don't really need to do any measurements. So the indications here actually are in case of emergency situation, all emergency procedure or urgent procedure, or the patient had, didn't have the chance to actually fast for two, four, six hours as per the guidelines. Uh, so unreliable or unclear fasting history, if it's unreliable, like as I, as I said, pregnancy, labor, diabetes, severe liver injury, severe kidney injury, or uh, trauma and, and, and uh, critical illness, uh, polymyoneuropathies and all that stuff, trauma and severe pain, all this will delay the gastric emptying and there is no guidance 
on uh, how many hours this patient should be fasting and if it's really fasting or not. Uh, so all this condition will cause potential uh, delay in gastric emptying with no clear evidence on where we are at the moment. Okay, so let's do some anatomical orientation before we crack on. And as you know, the stomach is starting from the cardia, and this is the fundus and body. And uh, luckily, the most dependent part is the antrum, even the pylorus, even it's after the antrum, yet it is still a little bit higher. So the most dependent area is uh, the, the antrum of the stomach, which is uh, luckily very identifiable part of the stomach using the gastric ultrasound. So this gastric antrum, when you put uh, your ultrasound probe in the sagittal or craniocaudal uh, uh, um, uh, section of the body, uh, or um, you will find here, this is uh, the kephalad part and this is the caudal part. So this is the head and this is the feet. You will find this is uh, the left loop of the liver and comes underneath uh, the antrum uh, of the stomach, uh, followed by uh, towards the back of the patient by the pancreas. And then uh, this is the aorta and originating superior mesenteric artery. And you may find as well, if you go a bit uh, more to the right side, instead of the aorta, you may find the inferior vena cava then the spine at the end of uh, the uh, ultrasound section. So skin and subcutaneous tissue, abdominal muscles, left to loop of the liver, this is the area of interest. And you will, I'll show you the sonoanatomy anatomy of that now in a second. So uh, left loop of the liver, the gastric antrum, followed by the uh, head of the pancreas or some part of the pancreas, followed by severe mesenteric artery, you may see or not. Uh, and uh, then aorta or IVC and then the spine. We need also to identify the five layers or orientate uh, ourselves with the sono anatomy of the five distinct layers of uh, the uh, uh, wall of the uh, antrum here. So this is a starting from uh, inside out. So the first thing is the uh, uh, air mucosal interface, which is here number five. This is air mucosa interface, followed by uh, the mucosa and submucosa, then the muscularis mucosa, and muscularis propria and ending by serosa, the outermost layer. So this appearance will happen if you change your probe from the craniocoda to the right, left, or perpendicular. I'm not really interested to do that uh, in most of our exams, and this is not a cornerstone. It is just to orientate yourself with the sono anatomy and be aware of the area that you examine. So let's do now uh, the positioning of the patient. There are three, three very common positions that we do uh, gastric ultrasound, which is supine position, and sitting position and the right uh, lateral decubitus, which is uh, uh, the most important position and uh, highly encouraged before you say this is an empty stomach or full stomach to go on the right lateral decubitus. And your probe, this is your dot or marker will be pointing towards the head and uh, the uh, tail of your probe or the uh, opposite side will be towards the feet or the caudal part. So this is our orientation here. What probe I use? So it depends on the age and body weight of your patient. If we're talking about an adult patient or pediatric age group, more than 30 kilograms, you will use the uh, low frequency curved uh, probe of abdominal uh, examination because with high high body weight or high BMI or uh, adults, you need higher penetration to, the, to diagnose the gastric antrum. But in kids less than uh, 30 kilograms, uh, you can use the linear probe. It's high frequency probe, uh, five to 12 uh, hertz. So it gives you very high accuracy. The only problem with this one is deep penetration. That's why in a pediatric age group, uh, it's, you don't need that much penetration, five or six centimeters should be fine with this one and you will get the accurate image and the very good uh, resolution with this one. So I, I would like to invite you uh, to use the linear probe in a small age group and enjoy the beauty of uh, ultrasound on the gastric and from using the linear probe when your age group and body weight permits. So this is how my image appears. So this is as we had dealt uh, with the previous image. This is the head, this is the toe, and this is the skin and subcutaneous tissue. This is uh, the muscles of the anterior abdominal wall. This is the left loop of the liver, and this is the gastric antrum. And this is here the spine, which is a spine sign. If you're familiar with that, 
with a long ultrasound between the spine and the gastric antrum, you will find this the, the pancreas and the uh, aorta and superior mesenteric artery is originating from the aorta here. I don't see the origin here, but you can find that in different images. And if you move uh, towards more towards the right side, you will find the IVC replacing the aorta. And if you move more towards the left, you will find the aorta is replacing the IVC. You may find either of them in this section here. Uh, why that's important? Because uh, they correlate the part of the end and calculations correlated uh, correlations we'll see that in the studies at the end of this lecture to either aorta and IVC the calculations are not really the same and this is one of the challenges of gastric ultrasound so this is a video showing a real life image of the skin subcutaneous tissue and anterior abdominal wall muscles and this is the left lobe of the liver and then comes this is gastric antrum you can see the spleen here sorry uh, this is slightly hiding uh, the abdominal aorta here. I cannot see the superior mesenteric artery origin at this view, but as you see here, it's it's like a target uh, 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 structure here or a circular structure in this view. This is how it appears as this is an empty antrum and we'll show you the differences now. So how we assess, we do that as always in our ultrasound examinations is either quantitative or qualitative. Qualitatively, we give it empty stomach or fluids or solids. So uh, grade zero is an empty stomach, grade one there is fluids. And at this stage, you need to measure how much fluids or the amount of fluids in the gastric antrum. And grade two is actually solids and you need to take no measures at this stage, patient is not fasting, whatever the amount patient is not fasting. Or you need to do quantitative assessment when uh, it is fluids. So uh, this is either uh, via the cross sectional area measurement or uh, the cross sectional area calculation. Calculation. So you can do that either way. I'll show you that how to do that in a minute. So this is again an empty gastric antrum, and this is how it appears here. So uh, antrum is uh, rounded in structure, uh, very thin wall. There is no content inside. So this is the serosa, and this is the muscularis mucosa and mucosa and submucosa here. And I can see no uh, mucosal air interface, or you can say this is the one here. So I can orientate now. This is an empty stomach. So again, you cannot judge this is an empty antrum until you do that in the right lateral decubitus. You cannot do that in the supine and just clear patient from gastric content. Supine and sitting are not uh, the best positions to do that. And this is how it looks in uh, in in, in uh, cut section here. This is the head. This is the feet. Again, I think you are now orientated. And this is the abdominal aorta and the spine is afterwards here. Okay, and that's part of the pancreas. Okay, so this is how the fluids or the clear fluids appears. So it's anechoic or hypoechoic shadow between two layers, anterior and posterior uh, walls of the gastric antrum. Okay, and this is our pancreas here, and this is uh, IVC or descending abdominal aorta. It depends if there's pulsations, you can put the pulse wave and detect is this aorta or IVC. I cannot swear what it is now. And then the spine behind. So again, skin, subcutaneous tissue, muscle, left lobe of the liver, uh, uh, gastric antrum showing anechoic or hypoechoic, that's fluids. So I need to measure now to know if this is uh, fulfilling the criteria of empty or, uh, or full stomach, if it is fluids, okay? So this is uh, how the solids appear in uh, the gastric antrum. And there's two stages of solids. The first stage is early stage. And this is the appearance of the early stage. It has a characteristic appearance. They call that the frosted glass appearance. What is the frosted glass? So it's something like that. Or you don't, if you don't know what's the frosted glass, it is this glass. So you can see it's like, um, I, don't, I don't want to say it, it's mosaic. It's not mosaic because the mosaic is a color presentation, but it's, it's something between echoic and hypoechoic and anechoic areas. Uh, interlacing and intervening uh, with each other. So this is usually at the early stage when the mixed echogenicity uh, says that this food is ingested between uh, maximum one or two hours. So this is the frosted glass appearance of the solid that's early stage. The late stages here, you will see a mix of uh, food and gastric juice here. And this means it's uh, more than one or two hours. So this is a solid late stage. And in both stages, either early or late, if there is a food in the stomach, the patient is not fasting. Uh, uh, milk uh, 
uh, cardinals uh, have been showing this typical biphasic hypoechoic hyperechoic uh, shadow so it's very easy to practice that with yourself your colleagues so in the morning before your operating list before you take anything you're still npo just put the probe on yourself or your colleague then invite him for a cup of tea and a sandwich and after the cup of tea you can repeat the exam and after you repeat the exam you will find the clear fluids and at the end you take your sandwich and re-examine again and then you will find uh, the early food stage with the frosted glass appearance so this is how you train yourself and find uh, it's it's very easy very doable uh, so now we let's go to the measurements and cut off values so empty stomach is in case of no content visible so that's grade zero clear fluids in the right lateral decubitus but appears empty when you put the patient at supine so it's a minimal fluid when you put the patient supine at this stage it disappears completely so this is an empty stomach or it's clear fluids when a cross-sectional area so this is the cross-sectional area less than 10 uh, centimeters squared in the right lateral decubitus or if you calculate the gastric volume this is another way to calculate it less than 1.5 mL per kg so if you're talking about the 70 kgs uh, gentlemen so it's 105 mLs. this is our cutoff full stomach is uh, if there is any solid content at any position the antrum is the Tinted with clear fluids, that's grade two. And if this uh, cross sectional area is more than 10 centimeters squared or the volume is more than 1.5 mils per kg, I think that's uh, yeah, like clear enough. So, here, this is how we measure the cross sectional area. There are two techniques to measure the cross sectional area either via tracing, and then you close the circle around the antrum from outside, please, not from inside. So, from the serosal surface, you do a circle, and the machine will do all the job for you. As you see here, it gives me it is 8.7 or 8.6 uh, centimeters. I cannot see from that distance. Oh, sorry, it's, it's like 5.5. Centimeter square. So this is the area. And then these are tables available online. You go to these tables and see according to the age group, if this is 20 to 30, 30 to 40, this is the age. And these green areas, green shaded areas are the areas considered empty stomach. So you can put here 5.5. If this is a 40 year old gentleman, 5.5. So it's something between five and six. So here, this is 36 and 51 uh, here. So that's still uh, it's uh, still uh, in, in, in the safe area or in the green area of empty stomach. There's another way of measuring that via the cross-sectional area. So you take the anteroposterior diameter, which is like that, and the craniocaudal diameter. So cranio craniocaudal and anteroposterior diameters. And as you know, if you are measuring uh, the distance from an oval shaped structure, this is how I get the area. It's not by to the radius uh, of uh, the part to the power of two as a circle, it's an oval shaped structure. So the area here will be by multiplied by the radius, uh, which is craniocaudal multiplied by the radius, which is anteroposteriorly. So you need to divide this by two and this by two, multiply both together, multiply them by the by, then you get the cross-sectional area. They simplified our life more because we are familiar more with the volumes. So they put a lot of equations. This is one of the challenges in gastric ultrasound. And gastric ultrasound, they said, OK, so we want to calculate the gastric volume from the antrum. It's 27 plus 14.6 multiplied by the cross-sectional area in right lateral decubitus again minus 1.28 multiplied by the age in years. And then you get the gastric volume straight away and you put your patient in the right track is fasting or from fasting. This is two patients I, I did myself um, uh, not long time ago. Third, the first was a 35 year old lady came for a lab coli. She's fasting as per the guidelines. So she's six hours fasting, but she's three weeks postpartum. In, in the postpartum there is a prolonged gastric emptying up to four weeks and there's no distinct guidelines what uh, time I could, should consider the patient fast for uh, how many hours. So I did the gastric ultrasound for this lady. And as you see here, this is something like a solid here. It's a late solid, okay? So here, I don't even need to do the measurement, but just for training purposes, I did these two measures. So it was uh, two, uh, 
2.74 one dimension and 3.18 if you take the diameter so the radius here and radius here and multiply them by the by you will get 11.8 so 11.8 if you compare here she is a 35 year old lady 11.8 is actually not fasting so at this stage you have to do a modified rapid sequence or rapid sequence induction or if the patient tolerates, and this is what I did, if the patient tolerates, you put a nasogastric tube uh, or uh, nasally, uh, the patient may tolerate that if you're quick enough and skilled enough and do uh, suction uh, or aspiration of the gastric content via the nasogastric tube, then take out your nasogastric tube, then induce the patient. But again, consider uh, her on fasting if you don't do that. So the second case was a 19 year old with a torsion testis. He came fasting for four hours. And I did, again, the gastric ultrasound here, and his uh, measures were 5.5, so I considered this patient fasting. Yes, I did a rapid sequence induction, but I was not expecting uh, a lot of trouble during intubation with this patient. So limitations in accurate in uh, subjects with abnormal underlying gastric anatomy, like the gastric bands, like the gastric resection or bypass, uh, any fundoplication in hiatus hernia. And there is loads of confusing equations how to change the cross-sectional area into gastric volume. It depends on the equation. There's loads of equation. Let's quickly go because I'm conscious of the time. I'm 19 minutes now. Quickly through the evidence. This is a publication in 2014, a feasibility study by Dr. Hamada and his colleagues using gastric ultrasound to assess uh, uh, for um, gastric antrum content compared to the CT showed a very good correlation and the reproducibility of the measurements in correlation coefficient of uh, 0.97, that's a good one, and one of the earliest one. In 2017, Dr. Sharma and his colleagues checked the correlation between the gastric cross-sectional area in relation to IVC and in relation to the aorta as landmarks to detect the aspiration volume. So after they detect by ultrasound, they aspirate the gastric content and see how much correlated to the gastric content and see uh, how is correlation coefficient. And for the IVC and aorta, it, the correlation coefficient was 0.92 and 0.86 respectively. So, and the most, one of the most impressive publications, which was done three years ago uh, by uh, Dr. Leviter and his colleagues on a 116 patient presented uh, for procedural sedation, not for GA, they are fasting around six hours. Still 69% of the patients using the ultrasound was categorized as full stomach. So please be careful when you're doing a conscious sedation on patient who's coming with a full stomach. Pediatric age group was not away from uh, the research. So Dr. Moser and his colleagues uh, published uh, that four years back and conducted gastric cross-sectional area again in right lateral decubitus with a cutoff of 2.19 and 3.07 in pediatric age group above one year. And it has sensitivity of 75% and 76% with a specificity of 36 and 67% in this age group and in this population. There's a nice systematic review uh, and meta-analysis uh, done by uh, Dr. Van uh, Lepot and his colleagues. Uh, and the, yep. Just one more yes, minute. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thanks so much. So uh, these are the publications. So it's multi-country uh, publications. Uh, they all checked the gastric antrum, and uh, they did that in the sagittal uh, and parasagittal sections. And they all used the gastric uh, antrum uh, cross-sectional area, and uh, they compared that to the nasogastric suction versus some people did gastroscopy and others did ingested volume and uh, they find that if your patient is empty stomach, it's an empty stomach. If it's full, so it's full stomach, then you can calculate the right lateral decubitus fluid content to say if it is less than 1.5 mLs per kg, uh, it is safe and low risk or low risk for aspiration. And if it is more than 1.5, it's high risk of aspiration. So insert a nasogastric tube and, uh, and, and suction on the nasogastric tube or do a modified rapid sequence induction with two young car suctions in hand, highly recommended. I'm really thankful this is Dorset uh, where I am living in this moment, but uh, I, I wished really if I can come and say hello to everyone in Alexandria. Thanks very much and sorry for uh, the two minutes delay. The mic is yours. Thank you, uh, Dr. Walid, uh, for your nice, uh, elegant presentation. Please keep us, uh, stay with us for the, till the end of the session for the discussion. For sure. First, thank you, Dr. Walid, for this great lecture.
Uh, I just have one question about a uh, 35 years old lady uh, scheduled for uh, lab coli. Uh, uh, you have said after uh, gastric assessment uh, by ultrasound, uh, uh, she still has gastric content after appropriate fasting hours. Uh, why did you uh, choose to do a rapid sequence induction or a weak uh, nasogastric uh, tube uh, before induction uh, and uh, didn't just uh, wait for some time and deassess uh, gastric content by ultrasound uh, as it uh, elective surgery? Uh, thanks again. Uh, perfect. Thanks so much uh, for a nice question. Um, it, it, as I said, the evidence is still processing. So we are at this stage, uh, medically legally, we are not entitled to use the gastric ultrasound as a guideline uh, because there is no enough evidence to put in the guidelines. But your question about the practice, why we did not keep her fasting for more hours. So I'm going to ask you the same question, how many hours? She was fasting for six hours, which is per guidance, this is the enough fasting hours, but actually she had some gastric content. So if I send her back to the ward for one hour or two hours or six more hours, and how many hours do you need to get her at the gastric emptying? That's the first point. So saying that it's a simple procedure and it's, it's consent form or what you need to do. Have a chat with the patient, Tell her this is what we have. This is the guidelines on the fasting hours and you're ticking that box already. Are you happy to go back to the ward at this stage for three, four, five hours more and come back? Or do a rapid sequence induction with good pre-oxygenation, which is, is not risk and hassle-free again, or insert an isogastric tube? Actually, we shared all that uh, decision-making steps after discussion with two expert opinions at this stage, this is what we have. We got a consensus on the management plan that we got. We involved the patient in the decision-making and we had an agreement on nasogastric tube. This patient was not on any anticoagulation, no risk of bleeding, and it was fast and quick aspiration of gastric contents via nasogastric tube. The question you asked me that why we removed the nasogastric tube after aspiration, because if you leave anything in the gastroesophageal sphincter at time of induction, there's a risk of aspiration. So if you are inserting the nasogastric tube to suck the gastric consent, it's, it's anecdotal evidence that you need to remove it. And for lab coolies, we are, we are not inserting nasogastric tube to stay in the patient's stomach anymore. Uh, so that was a practice maybe 10 or 15 years back, but they, they prefer for the rapid recovery of, pa of patients to take the nasogastric tube out as soon as possible after surgery, if we need it at all. So now we are not putting a routine nasogastric tube for any lab coli. So it was just for sake of aspiration of the gastric content in aspiration or suction and out and then induction. Uh, you asked me again in a private message about laryngeal mask in that case. Again, pregnancy with antiprestaltic waves and, and, and fasting guidelines, not clear about this one. Any antiprestaltic wave may push content from the intestine to the stomach. And this will again, even if you did the aspiration of the gastric content in the beginning, does not guarantee the patient will stay in a case of high abdominal pressure and for hour or two intraoperatively without any antiperistaltic movement. Thanks so much. I hope I answered your question.